So let's turn now to Matthew chapter 1. As Chet read to us there, starting in verse 18. I do hope you'll all have a wonderful Christmas. I pray you'll be blessed and you'll have a wonderful time with your family and that your time will be fruitful in the Lord. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful that the world does reflect, much of the world reflects upon Jesus this time of year. And it's always good for us to reflect upon Jesus as well, His birth, and, and, to, and to think about and remind ourselves why He came to this earth, why God took on flesh and came down here to serve us. It's a great time to remind ourselves, as we do every Sunday. His birth, of course, was a necessary part of his mission. He had an eternal mission, and his birth was the, the beginning of that mission on earth. And it was a glorious day. It was a day that changed the history, not only of this earth, but of the heavens. What a glorious day. We read in Matthew 1, verse 18, we read of the uh, conception of our Lord. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was a righteous man. You know, Joseph was betrothed to Mary, and he knew that he and Mary had not been together, and yet Mary was found to be with child. And so what do you conclude? Uh, from that. And so Joseph assumes that, that there was uh, unfaithfulness involved here, and he plans to send Mary away secretly. He was a righteous man. He, he didn't want to parade this sin around. He didn't want it to be known. He didn't want Mary to face that kind of embarrassment and humiliation. And to spare her from that, he's planning to send her away secretly. There's a lesson there for us to take to heart from Joseph. I'm reminded of the words of Peter in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, which says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. You know, it's the loving thing to do to, to not parade this around, uh, to cover this sin, Proverbs 10 and verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. There's a lesson here that we can learn from Joseph. And we see here the conception of Jesus, that the child was conceived in Mary, who was a virgin. This was miraculous. The child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so here we see the beginning of Jesus' life in the flesh, the beginning of his humanity. But make no mistake, Jesus existed from all eternity. This may have been the beginning of his earthly life, but he existed and was with God from all eternity. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He, he created all things. Nothing in this world came into being 
outside of the influence, the, the, de- the design of Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 tells us this as well, where we read of Jesus, For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Again, Jesus is divine. He is eternal. He was in the beginning with God. We're seeing here the divinity of our Lord. All things were created by Him and for Him. Things invisible were created by Jesus. And in Him... As we speak, our entire universe is being held together by the Word of Jesus. He is divine. He is God. We see again in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He also made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God made the world through Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father. He was that from all eternity. And He upholds all things by the word of His power. And so what an amazing thought, isn't it? That our Lord and Savior, the Eternal One, the Creator of all things, took on human flesh. He became the fullness of God in helpless babe. What an amazing thing. And so we see the divinity of our Lord, and we see in this passage, very important information here, the names of our Lord. And those names are very meaningful. Look with me at verse 21. The angel says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You shall call his name Jesus. Do you know what the name Jesus means? The name means Yahweh saves. Yahweh being the personal name for God that was revealed to Moses. Yahweh saves. God saves. It says, you shall call him that because he himself will save his people from their sins. Another powerful indication, another powerful statement that that Jesus is God. Yahweh saves, and this baby, Jesus, he himself will save his people from their sins. Jesus didn't come to save the people from, from the Romans, as many people thought the Messiah would do. He came to save people from their sins. His people. So don't we want to be numbered among His people? Because He will save His people from their sins. You know, each one of us had a major problem with sin. Sin was a ruler over us. Sin enslaved us. Sin separated us from God, and we face the eternal punishment of God because of our sins. Sin led to our spiritual death. Sin placed us under God's wrath. But Jesus came to save His people from their sins. Can we rejoice in that this morning? And we have to ask the question, how does Jesus save? Not through His birth, but through His death and His burial and resurrection. 
And his glorious birth was, was a necessary event that would lead him then to suffer and to die for all of us, for all of mankind. He was born so that he could die. He was born so that he could bear our sins in his body on the cross. He was born so that God could make him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. He came so that He could die for us and release us from our sins by His blood. He came so that He could save us from the wrath of God that was to come through His death and His resurrection. He came so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. His name was Jesus. Aren't we thankful that the Father has saved us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now look with me at uh, verse 22. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. The birth of Jesus was foretold by the prophets. Several hundred years before Jesus was born, they foretold that this would happen. Matthew is quoting here from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7. If you go back and read Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, it's a very fascinating read there. And the context of that in chapter 7 is that the Syrians and Israel, the northern kingdom, had teamed up together, and they were going to come and make war upon Judah. And God says to the king of Judah, to Ahaz, they're not going to be successful. They're not going to be able to prevail against you, and I'll give you a sign to prove that this is true. And what was the sign that was given? Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. So there's this virgin. She was a virgin at the time. And I believe this woman, who would have been well known, Isaiah says, the virgin. He points her out. She was going to have a child in the normal way. And that child would be named Emmanuel. And this would be a sign because God says, before that child is old enough to know right from wrong, I'm going to take care of your enemies. I'm going to take care of Syria. I'm going to take care of Israel. They're not going to be able to to be successful against you. And the the child's name was God with us. And God gives this child as, as a sign. And as the child grows up, before he's very old at all, God says, remember, I'm going to deal with your enemies. And Matthew sees in this, a type of Jesus who was to come. Uh, this, this child was a type of Jesus Christ uh, intended to reflect the coming of the child who was really literally born of a virgin and was literally, in every way, God with us. What a powerful name that is. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, I thought his name was going to be Jesus. right? He says you should call him Jesus. But then he says they will call him Emmanuel. I think he's talking about the people. The people will say, Emmanuel, this is God with us. This is God in the flesh. In Jesus Christ, God is with us. God came down to dwell with man. In Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God with us. 
We read in Philippians 2 about Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. God, the Eternal One, the Creator, He emptied Himself. He lowered Himself and took on the form of a servant. His name was Emmanuel, God with us. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus come and take on flesh? Hebrews 2, verse 17 says, Therefore, He had to be made like His brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Why did Jesus come down and take on human form? So that he could relate to us, so that he could sympathize with us, so that he could help us in our struggles with sin. He's able to be merciful. He's able to come to our aid because He knows what it's like to be human. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He's able to understand us. He's able to sympathize. He's able to help us because He took on flesh. And I love this verse in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's you and I, we partake of flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Why did Jesus come and take on flesh? So that He could render powerless the devil, the one who had the power of death. He shared in our humanity that He might suffer and die with us, and in doing so, He overcame death for us. Is that something to rejoice in, brethren? They called Him Emmanuel, God with us. Aren't we thankful that God came down to be with us? And He's still with us today. And the fact that God is with us, I think also clearly, powerfully shows us that God is for us. God is with us and God is for us. The question is, are you with Him? He has done everything to make fellowship with Him possible. To make relationship with with God possible. He has extended His grace. He's extended His mercy to every one of us through Jesus Christ. Have you come to Him that you may have life? Brad brought up earlier the judgment that's coming. Jesus names Yahweh, his name means Yahweh saves. Saves from what? He saves from the wrath that is to come. Have you accepted his grace and his mercy? Have you accepted his offer? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior, and you want to come to him to be saved, here's what you must do. Having heard and believed in Jesus, we have to commit to turn from our sins, to repent of our sins. We have to confess that He indeed is the Son of God and come to be baptized, immersed into water for the forgiveness of our sins. And you can be united with Jesus in His death, in His burial and resurrection and raised up to newness of life. If we can help anyone with that, we would 
be so happy to do so. And if you need to come back to Him, I pray that you would. He waits with open arms. To those who would repent and come back, He's waiting for you, joyfully waiting for you. So if you need to do that, we pray that you would. You can do that right where you sit. If you need prayers of the congregation, we'd be happy to pray with you. If there's any need, feel free to come and let's stand together and sing.